introduce myself, that's also good. If you have your Bibles with you, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 14. That's where we'll kind of start. Last week, last week, I, if you remember, I just asked a question. That's all I did. It took me 30 minutes, but we just asked one question. For 30 minutes, we kind of walked through the Scriptures together, and we walked through particularly certain men in Scripture who talked about God in a way that seems foreign to us. And we talked through, what I mean by this is, uh, we looked at King David. King David's going to talk to God and talk about God in ways that seem foreign to us. He says things like, my flesh yearns for you. I think about you throughout the watches of the night. My flesh yearns yearns for you like a dying animal in a drought my soul that's how my soul is right now without you he says in psalm 27 that one thing that i ask and all that i seek the only thing that i want is that i may dwell in the house of the lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the lord in his temple and then we moved on to habakkuk And in Habakkuk, he's just simply saying, I don't care what life throws at me as long as I have Jesus. If I'm rich or if I'm poor, if I'm safe or if I'm in danger, if everything's working well or nothing is working at all, as long as I have Jesus, I'm okay. And from there, we moved on from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and we looked at the Apostle Paul. And Apostle Paul said, I count all things everything a loss. I count them as dung compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. Paul was saying that the question is not, is it right or is it wrong? Just let me do the correct behavior. That's kind of the area that we perpetually live in. We always say, is this a right thing or a wrong thing? Let me do the right thing. And if that behavior is okay, then we're going to do it, even sometimes to the detriment of of our own spirits. Paul says that we're asking the wrong question. The question should rather be, does this get me more of Christ or does this rob me of my awareness of him and my affections for him? And that's how he did his life. He would say, I count that as loss. I count that as rubbish. I'm not interested in that if it doesn't get me more of Jesus. And so from there we moved on And we said that not only were men biblically like this, but men men historically have been like this. We talked about Luther. We talked about John Owen. We talked about Augustine. We talked about a few other guys. We talked about Brother Lawrence. And then we talked after that about Romans 8, about how the universe finds itself in the same place as those men. It longs. It wants. It wants the removal of suppression and the weight of sin off of its back. And it wants to be free of all of it, and it wants to be free in the glory of Christ. And the question that we got to after all of that wasn't, do men and women historically and biblically yearn and long passionately and pursue Jesus? And it wasn't, does the universe have this longing and this yearning? The question that we asked was simply, why don't we? Why are so many of us content? Why is a zealous passion for Jesus to have lordship over all the areas of our life such a rarity among us? And why is the pursuit of him, the full-on pursuit of him, such a rare commodity in the church? What happened to us that we have compartmentalized our lives so that church is over here, work is over here, family is over here, and that there's very little overlap or exchange between the three? So that was the question. And what I want to do today is just try and answer it. Why don't we yearn? Why don't we long? Why don't we pursue him? Why are so many of us content with where we are right now spiritually? Why do we not seem to have a zeal and a passion to know Christ deeply in our lives? So let's go to Isaiah 14, starting in verse 1. I'm sorry, Ezekiel. Thank you. Say one thing to another. Starting verse 1. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me. So if it's okay with you, I'm just kind of read a little, talk a little, read a little, talk a little, and we'll kind of chop it up that way. In the Old Testament period, God didn't speak 
or rarely did God speak to the entire nation of Israel. He didn't, with a thunderous voice, cry out to the nation, Go this way! You're awake now? Okay. What he did is he came to a prophet, and he would tell that prophet, Tell Israel to go this way. And that's how the system worked. And so, whenever the rulers of Israel needed to know a direction, do we go left, do we go right, do we attack, do we defend, what are we supposed to do? They would beseech or come before the prophet and ask the prophet to hear from the Lord. So that's what was going on in this text. The elders of Jerusalem, the elders of Israel, had come to the prophet to say, well, what do we do? So let's look at the next line. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. In the Old Testament, over and over and over again, and sometimes when I read it, I wonder, how can they do this? But then I have to look at my life and ask the same question. They're guilty of leaving the one true God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and they worship these false gods, these little deities. One of the most common ones in the day was Baal in the Old Testament, probably by far the most popular in the Old Testament. And so they would worship a foreign god, but that's not what's happening in this text. The accusation against the leaders is not that they are bowing down before, a de before another deity, but rather that they've taken an idol into their hearts. So this is a different kind of idolatry. It's one that we'll kind of need to talk about this morning. And when they've done it, they've kind of blinded themselves. So let's keep reading. God says, Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? All right, these men have come to the prophet. They said we need to hear from God. Do we go left? Do we go right? Do we attack? Do we defend? What are we supposed to do? And God says, I see idols in their hearts. Should I address their question or not? Let's keep reading. Therefore, speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Any one of the house of Israel who takes his idol into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with a multitude of his idols. Here's what God says. Men will come to me seeking direction, direction for their lives. And if there's idolatry in their heart, I'm not going to ask their question. I'm not going to answer their question. I'm just going to ask them about their idols. And I think for us, this, this idea of idolatry, it kind of gets lost on us. When I think of an idol, honestly, the first thing that comes to my mind is survival. <laughs> I'm going to get thrown off the, idol, off the island. And then the next thing that comes to my mind is people dressed up in funny little robes bowing down before a chunk of wood. That's what's in my mind. But honestly, idolatry is way more serious than that. It's unbelievably serious. And how it starts out in our culture, in the way that it works with us, there's, it's, it's unbelievably innocent, but in the end, it's overwhelmingly destructive. I'll explain how that happens. Idolatry in your heart and in my heart, it starts with a desire. We have a desire to have a nice house. We have a desire to drive a nice car. We have a desire to have a relatively in shape body. We have a desire for our kids to excel in athletics because what will our legacy be if little Johnny isn't the next Wayne Gretzky? We have a desire to have money in the bank and we have a desire that we're safe. We have a desire that things are, in most ways, easy for us. We have a desire that our kids get a good education and there is nothing wrong with any of those things, nothing. It's not wrong to want a nice house. It's not wrong to want a nice car. It's not wrong or sinful. It's not wrong or sinful to want our kids to be safe. It's not wrong or sinful to want a little cash. I want a little cash. 
It's not wrong or sinful. It's not wrong or sinful for want to be in, you know, have our bodies in good shape or to look good. None of that is wrong or sinful. It starts with a desire. Think of it as a sting in the palm of your hand. And over time, your hand begins to close around it. And then we say, this is no longer negotiable. And all of a sudden, that nice house, it's no longer negotiable. The nice car, it's not negotiable. Safety, it's not negotiable. Money in a pocket, money in the bank, it's not negotiable. Our kids' hockey career, it's not negotiable. In the end, what ends up happening is that we say to God, God, do whatever you want, but don't touch this. God, be who you are, don't touch this. Don't touch work, because in work, I find my value, I find achievement. So I'll do whatever you say, God, but in, but in the end, I'm not quitting this job. And don't risk my kids, Lord. Do whatever you want, but I want my kids to be safe. Do whatever you want, but I want my neighborhood to be safe. And what ends up happening when our hands close around this and we say that this is no longer negotiable, an idol has been born. And here's what happens, and here's why it's so devastating. What happens is in that moment, we have given an unbelievable amount of authority to that thing that we've now held in our hand. And I would say then, if work is your idol, then all of a sudden, people at work are viewed by you and thought of by you, like it or not, as a means to your success and your progression up the ladder. And all of a sudden, your kid's hockey career, it takes precedent over everything. And I see this a lot. It takes precedent, precedent over spiritual health. It takes precedent over coming to church. It takes precedent. It rules your life. It rules your wallet. It rules your weekends. And you've given an unbelievable amount of authority and power to hockey. And here's why all those kinds of idolatry are so devastating. When idolatry rules the hearts of men, what we, do, what we do not want in the end is an all-knowing, all-loving, omnipotent God of the universe who gives as he sees fit. Instead, we look for a divine waitress who brings us what we want. So why don't men yearn for the Lord? Why don't we pursue him? Why don't we cling at his feet? I have to wonder if so few of us do is because we've all guilty of having an idol in our hearts. And we know, we know, we know that as soon as we draw near to him, that's the thing he's going to want to talk about. And we don't want to let go because we think it's more precious than he is. And the good thing about being in the Bible Belt is that we can go to church and we can pretend all the days of our life. All we have to do is know when to raise our hand at the right spot in the song, go join a small group, join a Bible study, and everything's perfect. You know, the right time to say, hmm, what great insight. That's all we've got to do. We never have to address it. We don't ever have to let it go. We just keep coming to church, trying to be good people. And I can't stress enough, it is not wrong to want those things. It's just wrong to want them with a closed hand. You know what I want for my daughter? I want her to meet a very, very godly man. Chances of that are real slim right now. Because all we see out there right now are boys who could shave. 
They're like the dodo bird. They're practically non-existent. And it makes me weep. Because I've got a daughter who I want to meet, someone who will love her like Christ loves the church. And they're rare. We're praying for him. I know he's out there somewhere. But I would love for some guy to come in and romance her. Make me go, man, that kid's good. <laughs> That's really good. Can I steal that idea? Don't tell your mother. That's the kind of guy I want. And I want her to live in a safe neighborhood where she can raise little grandbabies and I can spoil them rotten and not discipline them and send them home high on sugar. <laughs> and I don't want her to take risks. I'll risk my life, but I don't want her to risk hers. But my hand has to stay open on that or I become an idolater. And I like my house. I love my house, if I can say it. I mean, I, we don't live large. It's an old place, but we fixed it up, and I like it, and I don't want to give it up. But my hand has to stay open on that. And like I said, we don't live large. I drive like a 2005 Yukon with like 400,000 kilometers on it, and it's starting to rust out, and I'm sure one of these days I'm going to be able to put my foot right through the floor and be a Flintstones car. But the air conditioner works most of the time. And I really like that truck, but my hand on it has to stay open. And Mac, I love this place. I've been here for 26 years now, and I love this place. And there was a time that I would never see myself leaving. But my hand has to stay open on that unless I become an idolater. And that's how idolatry happens. It's the reason that we stay away from the Lord because we're afraid that if we press into him, he's going to want to address this thing. And we don't want that because in the end, we value it more than we value him. So idolatry, it takes on several faces. That was a big part of it. Let me show you another big part. Let's turn to James chapter 4. Our care group spent a few months going through this, through James, last year. And uh, this, this chapter, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. You'll see right out of the bat the hate part I have for it. Verse 4. You adulterous people. Right out of the gate. I really don't like that part. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? That's my love part for the text. Once again, if we're honest, and I know this is church, it's probably not the place for that. I think... The majority of us feel like God, at some level, is very disappointed in the current us, but that he truly loves some future version of us. Like when we finally beat this, or we finally conquer that sin, or we finally give up this, we finally beat this. We finally unlock the key to the quiet time. We finally start having a half-decent prayer life. That's when God will love us. But right now, he's somewhat disappointed. This text would fly in the face of that. He says, right now, right now, he yearns for the spirit that he has sealed in you. He yearns. It's different than wanting. He yearns for it. He, it's a pain. He's in pain because of it. That's how much he wants. Let's keep reading, though. 
you need to see this next line. He says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. The other side, the other reason, this other piece of idolatry, this other reason why I believe that men and women don't fully pursue and passionately chase the creator of all things is the idea of this thing, pride. And I would define it simply as self-exaltation, thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. And here's how it plays out in the church community, the way I see it. In the end, we believe that we are smart enough, wise enough, clever enough, or good enough, so we view ourselves not in desperate need of grace and the things of God, but rather <laughs> that we are a tool in the hands of God to correct and to help other people. We don't need them ourselves. We don't need to press in ourselves. We don't need to do any soul searching. We don't need to walk through any of that. We don't need to submit to anything else because I'm all right. What I am is an agent of God sent here to transform the lives of sinners, and it proves itself in this, and I've been convicted of this over and over again. It's one of the things in my life that God keeps pointing at. Whenever I think it, whenever I say it, when I'm sitting here and listening to a sermon, and I go, oh, I wish so-and-so was here today. I sure hope so-and-so is listening. Because they really need to hear this. Here's another thing I think that we see in our church a lot. There are men and women who can't sustain relationships for any period of time. They have good friends or a church for about six months, and then something happens, and they walk away, and they go to another church, or they go to another group of friends, and they have another group of friends for about six months. And then they do it again, and they do it again. And if you go and you have coffee with these people, you sit down with them, they can tell you everything that was wrong with that church. They can tell you everything that was wrong with those people that they were friends with. But what they can't see is that the common denominator was them. I can tell you why everybody else has issues. But I can't see it in my own life. People who walk in pride are perpetually in crisis. There's always something happening, and it never has anything to do with them. It's always somebody else's fault. It's absolutely devastating to our pursuit of Jesus Christ because in the end, we don't believe that we really need him, even though all objective evidence would say otherwise. But you can't see objective evidence. It's this insane belief in our own sufficiency that robs us of freedom and life, pride. I mean, God has flat out said, I oppose the proud. I will oppose the proud. I will know them from afar. They will not be able to draw near to me. Read that again. God opposes the proud. And so these two ideas, they kind of pour into the last idea. If we turn to Romans 1, verse 18. Romans 1, it's kind of one of those heavy scriptures that always kind of weighs down on me anyway. And this is something I kind of just learned over the last few months, I think. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So here's what we're going to find out. God pours out wrath from heaven on man. 
And that's what this text is going to be about. So let's look at the way he pours out his wrath on us. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. Pride and idolatry, they're about to fly up in our face here. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. So we've all done this. We've said, okay, there is a creator. There is a God in the universe, but this desire, this thing that I've been holding in my hand is now more valuable than him. And that's not honoring God as God. It's idolatry. They did not honor God or give thanks to him. That's pride. The reason we don't give thanks to God about everything that we have because at a certain level, We believe that we did it. So why do we need to thank him? So let's look at God's response. Continuing on. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up or gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Okay, so God reveals his wrath on mankind. Did you see anything in there about plagues? This wasn't a trick question. Hurricanes, tsunamis, acts of terrorism, Any of that? I don't see any of it either. In fact, what I see is somewhat more horrifying than all of those things. So look at how God's wrath is revealed. You and I fail to acknowledge him him as God. That's idolatry. And we fail to give him thanks. Why thank him? Because we did it. That's pride. So we have this thing that we value above and beyond God. We want this more than we want him, more than we want his will. So God responds by doing nothing. And he pours out his wrath by letting us chase our idols. And then what happens? Our thinking becomes futile. The majority of men and women spend their time, their energy, their thoughts, their fantasies, on things that are absolutely transient. There is nothing that you own now, there is nothing that you are chasing that is not going to be in a junkyard in a hundred years. But all of our energy and all of our thoughts and all of our efforts and all of our fantasies revolve around getting it, these disappearing, non-eternal things. That's futile thinking. And then the scary part is that God darkens the hearts. He hardens it. And I know it's a wildly popular idea among some churches who at the same time profess to read the Bible, but God hardens the heart seven times in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus is telling these parables to his disciples, and it's starting to get on the disciples' nerves, basically. I mean, every time they ask him a question... They come up to him, and he tells a story. And the disciples are, (laughs) just say yes or no. Just answer the question. But everything is in in the form of a story. How many times should I forgive my brother? That reminds me. There once was. And the disciples are just, stop it. Why are you doing this? So when when they confront him on it, they say, why are you telling all these stories? Why do you speak in parables? And what do they tell him in Mark 4? How does he, how does he respond in Mark 4? He says, so that they'll hear, but they won't understand. Huh? (laughs) 
Yeah, this generation, it's wicked, it's perverse, and they've turned their back on me, so I've given them over to their sin. They're not going to understand. He even looks at the Pharisees later on and he says, you brood of vipers, you study the scriptures in vain, those scriptures that testify about me, but you can't see that they testify about me. Why? Why? Because God has hardened their hearts so that they will be seeing but never perceiving. Romans 11, it's an overarching it talks about an overarching hardening of the nation of Israel's heart towards Christ. One day it'll be lifted, but right now their hearts are hardened towards the Savior. What about Pharaoh, the king, Hesh, king of Heshbon? God hardens the hearts of men who say, I'd rather have this than you. And God eventually just says, have it. Which is why I think one of the greatest acts of mercy that God has ever can ever bring about is busting us in our sins. It might sound like wrath at the time, but it's his mercy. His wrath, he just lets it go unchecked. But his mercy, he just says, I'm going to bust you in this one. Go taste You remember Abraham? He walks into King Abimelech's kingdom with his beautiful wife Sarah on his arm and he's terrified that they're going to kill them because everybody's going to want his wife. So he turns to his wife and he says, Sarah, you're my sister. <laughs> okay, you're my sister. And I, I've been married now for 30 years and I can't help but think that that's probably not a great idea. If you're ever... Uh, if that ever comes up in your life, I don't know why it would, but choose death. It may be painful, it may be slow, but choose death because I don't think you ever get to come back from that one. And you just see the next argument. Doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, but remember that time <laughs> that you told me to sleep with another man because you were a coward? Yeah, there's just no coming back. Anyway, <laughs> pick death. <laughs> I lost my place. So anyway, so God, King Abimelech takes Sarah into his harem. He goes to bed that night, and God shows up. He says, yeah, they're not going to let you sin against me. There's not going to be any sinning in here today. Yes, God does harden hearts. Could we agree corporately that that's a terrifying idea? Does it feel warm to anyone? I would say no. And I think that some people use, use that terror of being confronted to be a reason to sit in their sin. We use it as a justification to be lazy about the state of our heart. But if there's any part of you that is afraid of getting a hard heart, if there's any part of you that longs for your heart to be soft, if there's any part of you that longs for it to be softer, then I would say that you probably have a soft heart for now. The longer that you sit and stuff those sins, the harder and harder it gets. And if there's any of you in here today that is sitting here thinking, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what you're saying. In the end, it seems likely that the other is occurring. Don't be deceived. You will not mock God. That's not going to happen. So the billion dollar question then is, how do we know what's going on in our hearts? How do we know if we have any idolatry? How do we know if there's any pride? How do we know what's really going on in our hearts? Because even the Bible says that our hearts are deceitful. 
think a lot of times it boils down to community. When we isolate ourselves, we put ourselves in a place where we can easily hide. We can easily hide our sins. We can easily hide our true characters. We can easily hide who we are. But when we are with brothers and sisters who love us dearly, and we give them permission to speak into our lives, we give them permission to point out those things that, hey, maybe this doesn't line up with the word. Maybe this doesn't quite work out properly in your life. Then we have a fighting chance. There are days when we feel like all is well. There are days in my life where I'm walking around and I think I've got it all together. And everything feels amazing. I feel like I'm walking in obedience. I feel like I got a handle on some quiet time and I got a handle on reading the scriptures. And all of a sudden, you know, it swings open the closet to a spot in my life that I forgot was there. I mean, I'm 26 years into this and it happens all the time. And for the same things I keep letting back into my life, it seems like it's always happening. It's like, oh, I'm being completely obedient. Great. Oh, <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. So do you have idols in your life? Are you walking in pride? Have you closed your hand on something? Some of us know. The second I said it, some of us were, oh, I don't want to be here. Why did I show up today? I should have gone somewhere else. I can't wait till Jason gets back. <clears throat> but we all have them. We all have them somewhere. Let's pray. I'm just going to come and lead us. And if you need someone to pray with you, come up front. We'll pray. I look around. I really see just the core here today, which is kind of cool. So all the people that would pray with you are all sitting here. <laughs> Father, I thank you for these men and women. And I thank you that we have this opportunity just to open up these scriptures and have them sit over us. And I pray more that it's more than just us reading them this morning, Lord, but that these scriptures would read us. And my prayer is that you would begin to peel away the veneers, you peel away the false pretenses and just the religious stink, and that we would just sit honestly and naked before you. And I pray that this would lead to our repentance. And it would lead to a deep yearning and a deep longing of the things of you, no matter what the cost. And it would lead to a revival. And in the end, I think that my hope is that you would just break our hands. That you would loosen our death grip on the things just the hanging on to that we think are so supremely valuable <clears throat> and that we would just turn and in turn grab a hold of you that we'd be like the man in, in, in your parable that he would s sell everything sell it all to buy the field and we would buy in with all that we are ask this in Jesus' name.